from the USDA with characterizing the soil ecology of red raspberry produced under different production regimes. Mm. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Well, thanks for joining me this afternoon. Uh, I'm not even he quite here myself, I don't think. I've uh, spent last week in Europe, and then I uh, spent one day in Illinois, throw in a nine-hour time difference, jet lag, and a couple hundred-mile drives. I think I'm ready to take a nap here. I think I've been up since 2.30 this morning, so uh, if I do something crazy, I will go ahead and pre-warn <laughs> pre you all that uh, uh, it can happen. Uh, do we have a time up here just so we can? Okay. Five minutes. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Great. So I'll be talking a little bit about uh, microbial ecology of red raspberries. Uh, in this case, I've left the talk much less technical and more of a conceptual talk. I didn't want to get up here and hammer you with details at four o'clock in the afternoon because. Uh, even I would glaze over as a scientist. So I was assuming that most of you weren't going to be scientists. So I kept it kind of light and kind of conceptual, kind of to give you how we got here, why we're here, and then where we're going from here is kind of the basic idea of my talk. And, uh, and that's my outline. We'll give you some microbial ecology basics, but it's more kind of about how we got here. Why, why are we studying microbial ecology now? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the data that we actually got from our field experiments this past two years. And then we'll move on to future applications and how we hope to use this kind of information in the future to solve your agricultural problems. So microbial ecology, you know, why do we care? Well, microbial ecology is just the ecology of microorganisms. It's their relationships with each other, their relationships with their host, and relationships with the environment. And it contain, concerns all three major domains of life. Uh, the microbiome, you've probably heard of this word, microbiome is just all the microorganisms that are in association with something. Uh, most famously, you're probably familiar with the Human Microbiome Project, uh, 2008. Uh, it was a major project by the NIH where they went through and uh, characterized all the microbes associated with the human body. And we learned a lot of great things about this study. One thing we know, there's three pounds of bacteria and fungi on the human body at any given time. Uh, microbes outnumber human cells about 10 to 1, and kind of most impressively, I didn't, I didn't even th think of this, but the number of genes that microbes have is a, at least 100 times greater than the number of genes that the humans have. So again, uh, and it's also changed our view of how not only humans, but plants and other animals, that humans are not like a single species, but it's really just a macro complex of uh, species with all these bacteria and fungi associated with them. So now we don't, like I said, we don't longer think of ourselves as um, just a, a lone species. By that I mean, if, we, if you were a sterile human being, they killed all the microbes in you, you wouldn't be a human being, you'd be dead. In the same way with plants. Uh, a long time ago, they thought a sterile plant was a good plant. Now we don't think that at all. Uh, we know that there's uh, tons of stuff inside your plant and, and there should be tons of stuff inside your plant. So we'll switch into the plant side of things. And the plant side of thing is the phytobiomes. And the phytobiomes are just all the microbes associated with the plant. And we, we can kind of subdivide this into a couple different groups. The phylosphere, just all the aerial components of the plant. The rhizosphere are the roots and the area, the root surface and the area like within the first sixteenth of an inch of the soil around the roots. And the endosphere would be the stuff actually inside the plant. And now, uh, as I said, these uh, plant microbe associations are well established and even the earliest fossil, fossil records show that you know that early plants were associated with fungus inside the plants so these things have evolved for the last uh, 400 600 million years as uh, commensals so I think they're very important to our plant cycle and so why is this important now and how has science changed to make this important well as a scientist who's studied many different areas, I always say that scientists, science is very easy. Uh, you know, basically when it comes down to it, all science is is you're correlating some uh, experimental variable with some experimental observable. It's as simple as that. You know, most of the time it's maybe we're doing experimental variable with nitrogen and the experimental observable is yield or our experimental variable is plant cultivar and our observable is disease resistance. So, 
in, in essence, it's very, very easy. And usually when technology changes, it changes that experimental observable part of the equation. And that's what we can see. We get new tools, new machines that can measure smaller amounts, new things. And, um, and so basically it gives us a way to see things we haven't seen before. And that was kind of what, what advances the technology. In this case, you know, uh, you can't observe something if you can't physically measure it. And so when, when I started my career, maybe, you know, 15, 20 years ago, and you asked me about plants on microbes, uh, we would have been doing it this way where we would have, uh, to see one microbe on a plant, we basically had to kill all the other microbes and selectively played out the one microbe. And so you can see how labor intensive this is. And even if you went to a medical hospital, they would be doing this selective plating thing to identify the microbes associated with something. And uh, this was semi-quantitative, but pretty much is more qualitative. It's just whether you're hot or not. And then as my career progressed, we moved into everything was DNA for the last 10 years or so. And it became more routine where we could extract DNA from something. And as long as we had like a unique marker of the organism that we wanted to look at, we could use PCR, quantitative PCR, to look at that organism just by looking at the DNA. And this was a, a big step forward because it allowed us to look at more than one thing at a time, but it also uh, was, became quantitative. And, and one of the interesting um, aspects of this is, you know, when we can do more than one at a time, then we can start to make, um, you know, bigger conclusions. And so, but what this has led to is, you know, when you can only look at one or two things at a time, our understanding of this whole phytobiome is very limited because, you know, as I just said, uh, a plant is really just a big, structure with a whole bunch of microbes in it, where the microbes outnumber the, you know, the plant cells. And so you can kind of think of it as a city with a bunch of cars, but if you can only look at, you know, the, the green 87 Nissans, and you can't look at all the other 10 million cars out there, it's kind of like a false story. And now we know that, uh, you know, like in the plant world, like when your city's on fire, yeah, there's a bunch of green Nissans there, but so that's probably the bad guy, but, you know, but we don't see most of the stuff in plant pathology till the fire is already, till the damage has already happened. And so then it's much more, uh, at least to a very simple model of plant pathogenesis. And as being scientists, we like to be reductionists. And so we basically make things as simple as possible, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And part of this is we can only count or measure three things, that, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So, uh, but that's not the real case in the world. The real case is, is closer to this, where it's closer to the Middle East friendship chart, where there are good guys who are, are good the, most of the time. There are some guys who are bad all the time, but most people, it's complicated. You know, they're good in one scenario and bad in another scenario. It's kind of like teenagers. You know, you can have a group of teenagers, you know, and they're fine, but on the nine times out of ten, but on the tenth time, they do something crazy. It's kind of some kind of group dynamic, you know, so you can't say they're all bad or all good, but when you get them into a group, you never know you know, kind of what's going to push them over the edge. So now we're talking about our current technology. And our current technology allows us to see everything at the same time. And this is, uh, you know, a big step. And, you know, we have a microbial sample here. And all we do is extract DNA from the environmental sample. And then we amplify a, a gene common to all these organisms out of those uh, extracted DNA. And ideally, our amplified gene will be at the same ratio as the underlying population. So if you have, in this case, I have three blue species, two green, and one red. Once I sequence those, they should be come back at the end to be in the final ratio of three green species, or three blue species to two green to one red. And so then this technology is not new, you know. I actually could have done this experiment in 2008, but it would have cost me probably a thousand times more than it did today. And if you look at this chart, this chart is, is a magnitude of 10. So if we go from, say, 2007, where it's $100 a megabase pair, to now, where it's less than a penny a, penny a megabase pair, that's a huge difference. Uh, and again, it actually, uh, I can actually pinpoint one of the days that um, I really became interested. And again, if you remember back in, two, in the late 2000s, all the genome stuff was coming out as genome this, genome that. And I knew it was going to be a big deal, but uh, I went to a meeting in 2010, a, a meeting in Corvallis, Oregon, a phylosphere meeting. And at the time, all the big scientists were at this meeting. The big guys were showing this kind of data. They had just gotten, you know, they was, these were the big labs that have a lot of money, you know, the UCLA, Berkeley's, and the, 
and they were starting to do this and they just kind of and this was kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back for me where i i could see where this is changing the world you know this, or this is really going to be a big thing and so uh after that meeting i went back and lobbied my bosses i said you know this is the future we got to go back here and we got you know we got to get on the boat or we're going to be left behind and so uh through some luck and some uh, excellent lobbying I was able to uh, procure my first DNA sequencer in 2011. And with a lot of um, early successes and showing the, the utility of this to my other advisors, I convinced them to spend like another million dollars the next year or two investing in kind of filling our, our lab with all this technology. And since then it's kind of been to a plug and chug kind of a mode where we're really kind of adapting this and we're trying to turn this into like a routine observable for any experiment that we do. We're gonna automatically follow microbial ecology. We're gonna you know, do these things. So now the problem is we can see all the microbes. And, and that is the problem, because we can see everything now. I mean, and so it's again, it's almost kind of like the terrorist problem now. You know, who's, who's the terrorist? Because everybody looks the same, everybody, um, there's so much data that's kind of overwhelming. And so you, if you think about it, and what we really, we don't really want to see a plant in a healthy or disease state. We want to see the disease state right before it becomes an economic loss. We want to see it before that happens. And so before, you know, before the damage happens. And so that's kind of like this kind of a system where you have a healthy system, you have a disease system, a just very disease system, and you're trying to find the new stack and say, okay, this is kind of, once this guy does something, then the cascade starts to happen. And, uh, then the whole disease process moves forward. So these are the kind of areas that we're, uh, these are the kind of problems we're trying to focus on now is how to find a needle in the haystack. So now we'll move into a little bit of uh, experimental details. It's a simple experiment. We had uh, two, uh, two different uh, treatments. One was a control plot and the other one was looking at a, a, a plot that had a different compost treatment on it. The compost was dairy solids and mustard seed meal and um, we had this was basically a piggyback experiment this experiment was already going on we just added microbial ecology uh, as an experimental observable in this case we had three biological reps just because that's what the original underlying experiment had we also added two technical reps where we sample the same thing twice we determined both bacteria and fungi spring and fall and then we looked at bulk soil the rise of plane and endophytes so how many microbes are there on or near a raspberry plant well I combined the 120 samples that we have, and I can conservatively say now that there are at least 3,500 bacterial species, 7,800 fungal species. And I, I say this as conservatively because how we do this is, you know, we actually have to sequence a piece of DNA for each sample, uh, for each uh, uh, individual organism. And in this case, I sequenced probably 20 million pieces of DNA for this, and so I'd at least see the the, the same species five times before I said, you're in here, make sure you just wasn't a mistake. And then not all species can even be resolved. Sometimes uh, we can't tell two, two closely related species apart. So we just kind of group them into one pile of, uh, okay, I can't see Bacillus subtilis and Bacillus firma, so you're all just Bacillus, so uh, we'll stay there. And then also there's some lineages that we need to target separately, like Omocetes, which would be like your Phytopteris. So now we have real data. And all this is, is uh, if you're the same color, you're kind of in the same uh, taxonomic group. And if you're different shades of the same color, then you're closer relatives. So you can kind of think of maybe the colors, genus, and the, uh, the actual shaded area or species. But I think it's more like a phylum and higher level. But that, for our purposes, it don't matter. All it sees, all you need to know is if the color's different, then the underlying uh, community's different. And you, so this is just a sample of bulk soil looking at the bacteria from the spring of 2015. And you say, wow, there's not much happening, not much difference between those two things. And, and there, is, there is no statistical difference between those two things. And it kind of goes with what we know that it's hard to change the bulk soil uh, microbial community with minor things. So we jump to the fall. Wow, that's even more boring. That looks like almost uh, you know, identical. Those were more closely together than the first one. So yeah, that is kind of um, you know, surprising. But the good part is, is the reproducibility is very good. You know, even though it says the same results, I can show that's very reproducible. But then when you look at the, go backwards and say, let's look at the fall versus the spring, then you can see big blatant differences. 
and again, I don't want to get too much into what these actual differences are. And in this case, they're not real exciting. Uh, do I have a pointer here? Okay, I know like these, uh, uh, these, these ones here are acidobacter. Uh, you can see they're big in the spring. And then as the uh, season goes on, it moves into uh, these chlorobacteria, which are interesting because they're thermophiles. I, don't, I didn't know what chlorobacteria was. And so I looked it up and it says, commonly thermophiles like temperatures that are 100 to 140. Well, that sounds like Washington, you know, 100, 140. But then it occurred to me that uh, soil gets very hot. I mean, and, and then when I saw the actual fields, yeah, it kind of hit me that, yeah, bare soil does get very hot. And I actually had an experiment maybe five or 10 years ago where I had something, I, I put something out, I put some wax granules outside and they were supposed to melt like at 150. And uh, I didn't think anything, I went back out later and they all melted and I was like, there's no way that that soil was 150 degrees, but of course we put probes out there and soil gets 150 degrees in the middle of the day. Bare soil. If you have turf or irrigated grass, it stays at about the air temperature. But bare soil is, uh, is a whole new ball game. So now we look at, so that was the bulk soil. Now we're jumping to uh, right up against the roots and on the root surface. And here you can see we have a control in the treatment. The only difference is this small uh, group area at the top, that light green section. So then we look at the uh, fall. And uh, what's interesting here is if you remember the bulk soil, it changed a lot between the spring and the fall. Whereas if you look at the rhizoplane or the stuff right at the surface of the roots, it pretty much stays the same in the, in the spring versus the fall. And what's interesting is, is and this is just on the bacterial side of things, the only thing that was statistically significant in these samples between the control and the treatment for these time periods was this bacteria called TM7. Uh, I didn't know what TM7 was, so I looked it up. And it's actually a bacteria that's only been identified mostly through these kind of DNA experiments. Over the last 10, 5, 10 years, people keep seeing it pop up. And what it is is a very small bacteria that's, uh, for the scientists, it's 3 to 500 nanometers. 700 kilobase genome, so it's very minimalist of a bacteria, and they didn't know what it was doing or, or anything about it, but uh, one of the interesting things is somebody just showed this year that it's kind of like a parasite where it, it gloms onto the side of another bacteria or another fungi, so what this is doing in uh, raspberries, and uh, we have no idea, but it's uh, the one difference we did see between uh, the control and the treatment on the bacterial side of things. Now we jump onto the inside. So this is the inside versus the outside of the root. Uh, this large bright orange section turned out to be a cyanobacteria. Uh, and again, I'm not convinced that it's all the way inside the plant because these are known to form biofilms on the roots of the plant. So it may have been that I just couldn't uh, get them clear out the outsides, clear them all off the outsides good enough to separate it from the insides. So now we'll move into the more exciting stuff. Yeah, the fungi, the fun, the fun stuff. And uh, fungi are way more complicated than the bacteria. And you can kind of see this is the bulk soil, spring and fall control treatment. And there's differences between the spring and the fall, kind of like we saw before. But like I said, in this case, you get a list of uh, the fungi that are in your sample and how abundant they are. You kind of just thumb through that list and see if anybody rings a bell. Well, this guy rings a bell to me, Botrytis. I've heard of him before. And I know he's uh, wears one of the black hats. So, uh, I looked him up and it comes up as Botrytis carolinium. And so I was like, well, this is kind of odd. And then I looked it up because I never heard of this species either. And it, of course, it's isolated from a blackberry in South Carolina. It's just been described in 2012. So this is kind of interesting. Uh, you never know what you're going to find when you start looking for stuff. And then I found another species that I'd never heard of before called Ilionectria macrodidima. And I don't know Ilionectria. But I do know a little bit of Latin, so I know nectra is a, nec a necrotroph, and a necrotroph is something that kills its host and feeds on dead plant material. So again, I knew this guy was likely a plant pathogen. And lo and behold, I look him up, and he is found in British Columbia in grape uh, vines, but he, he's the fungal pathogen that causes blackfoot disease in grape vines. So okay, that's kind of interesting. So now let's jump onto the inside of the plant and on the surface. And again, uh, the one thing I did notice about the fungi, they were highly variable. So each sample was much more different. Like each of these plots are really the average of those five individual plots. And uh, one of the things that stuck out here is if you remember who that uh, 
big black spot is. Oh, Botrytis. Uh, so I was like, oh yeah, here's here's the uh, you know here's the story because you know I have a bunch of Botrytis in my control. I don't have Botrytis in the treatment, you know. Uh, but then when I actually looked at the individual samples, uh, Botrytis was 50% in one sample and then hardly anything in the other sample. So basically, one sample was very hot with Botrytis, and so it was uh, highly infected. And so then um, the ileonectria was back again, okay? So again, it's kind of the same thing where one or two samples were, were really kind of hot in this uh, pathogen and, uh, and the rest were more of like the traditional. And then when I was looking at the literature, I see this. Co-infection by Botrytis and ileonectria uh, during propagation causes rapid decline in young grapevine. So this is basically kind of like the replant disease and uh, grapes. And again, the interesting thing is, is they say it's a co-infection. Co-infection would imply that you're infecting at the same time, that when ileonectria and botrytis are there, that they infect at the same time. I don't see that. I either see it smoking hot in botrytis or I see it smoking hot in ileonectria when they're present. I don't see both of them together. Okay, so to where do we go from here? In the short term, I think we need to broaden our sampling. This was just one field, uh, you know, three different, six different plots in one field. So we need to broaden around the region to understand, you know, how the sampling, you know, changes with location and grower practices. We need to understand the distribution and potential of this black root foot root issue. If it's actually a, I don't even know for sure that it's a plant pathogen, but it's, it's likely a plant pathogen. Uh, we need to evaluate fields with distinct performance differences in a given season. Uh, sample the best and the worst, but I, don't, I was thinking about it, and I don't really need to sample the worst because we know what it looks like when it's the worst. We need to find something with maybe uh, great and not so great so we can kind of see what the differences are. And then uh, we need to evaluate and monitor recently established plants to understand microbial free plant disease. So it, and we could possibly combine this with like fumigation practices to understand how this works. And by that, I just mean that uh, we could uh, put a plant in the ground and then monitor it as a function of time to see what kind of microbes it picks up. So we could look at the fumigation process, see what the fumigation process does to the soil microbial ecology, and then we'll see what the soil microbial ecology does to the plant microbial ecology. So longer term, uh, I think we'll see this more and more that, uh, that managing the phytobiome for agricultural benefits will be here to stay. Uh, we'll see stuff that are targeting disease and pest suppressive soils, biofertilizers for enhanced nutrient uptake. That probably won't happen in uh, raspberries, but some other places with more marginal soils would be using the biofertilizers. Uh, endophyte inoculums to enhance stress tolerance. Uh, that's very interesting because that's one of the things we've learned over the last five or ten years is that endophytes inside of plants really one of the main things that they're really good at doing is stress tolerance and uh, one of the most elegant examples i've seen of this was there's a, uh, a scientist who uh, isolated a plant from yellowstone national park around one of the geysers that had high thermal tolerance so this plant could grow right out there next to the geyser at you know 50 c or whatever that is, 130 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And uh, they isolated a endophyte from it and they could show that you needed the endophyte to give the plant the phenotype to have thermal tolerance. So if you take away the, if you, if you treated the plant with fungicide, it killed the endophyte, the plant no longer had thermal tolerance. And what was even more elegant about this study is they went on to show that not only did the plant need an endophyte, but the endophyte needed a virus. So, so there was a virus inside of an endophyte, inside of a plant that gave the plant thermal tolerance. And then you're like, Whoa. you know, that's amazing. And, and then what's gone on is there's even other systems that show uh, similar properties. There's, a, there's an interesting insect system, I think it's a caterpillar, where there's a symbiotic bacteria inside of a caterpillar. And this, if this bacteria has a virus inside of it that protects it against an insect parasitoid, so you have an insect that if it has a bacteria that has a specific virus, then it protects that insect from attack from another parasitoid insect. So again, you have these multitrophic or multipartite interactions controlling, you know, uh, plant pathogen, in this case, insect pathogen, but you have the same thing in plant pathogenesis too. So it's, uh, it's an exciting time. And that's part of the reason why I keep saying this is going to be the ecology decade, because we can start pulling, a, pulling apart these uh, really complex interactions moving forward.
And our last one here was uh, code of our optimization. Ultimately, we're going to have to start incorporating these, these interactions in when we start doing uh, code of our optimization. So I think one of the things we do when we select for plants is we may do some of the work, you know, if, a, if we treat a plant with fungicide, maybe we can select a plant that doesn't have uh, endophytes that have fungicide ability into them. And so I think some of those things in the future will um, have to change. We'll, we'll go back to letting the, the plant pick out its uh, community. And one thing that's very interesting is, is how big of an impact the plant can control its own community around it. And I always say that plants like to buy their friends with food because basically what they do is through their root exudates, they kind of decide who's going to colonize them or at least who's trying to who recommend who's going to colonize them. In this case, uh, you know, some plants put up to 25% of their carbon or 25% of their carbohydrates into their root exudate. So they spend a lot of energy trying to control who's down there on their roots. And, and ultimately, they're probably also trying to control uh, uh, what's inside of the uh, you know plant also because I know some of the really interesting things like you know just thumbing through this data I would find one plant that has a, a fungi that I know is an insect pathogen uh, so so wow this plant has an insect pathogen inside of it wonder why that is but then I would see the same plant would have multiple different types of insect pathogens in it so it kind of tr triggers your mind why does this plant this why does this individual plant have insect pathogens inside of it and again, had this plant experienced some, uh, you know, parasitoid or insect activity, and he's trying to recruit his army to fight, or you know, but you'd only see it in one plant. So and again, I, I don't get to see the plants all the time, so uh, it's, it's hard to make the judgment. So some of you are probably thinking this guy is some kind of an organic hippie, you know. But unfortunately, uh, I was uh, my degree's in chemistry, so I believe in you know chemistry is uh, brings good things to life. And, but I've been working on beneficial microorganisms now for 15 years. And so I about fainted when I saw this. And, uh, and this is basically an article I saw in uh, chemical, engineering, uh, chemical and Engineering News, which is the trade magazine for the American Chemical Society. And it says, Growing Crawfets with Microbes. Hugh Grant, chairman of you know, Monsanto, calls microbes the next major platform in agriculture that will drive yield and productivity beyond the seed itself, and seed treatments incorporating these microbes will be the biggest near-term opportunity. So, so needless to say, I was like, you know, wow, that's, uh, that, that's coming from a nozzle head himself. Uh, and so just about uh, a few years ago, big ag started really moving into biologicals. This started when Bayer Crop bought AgriQuest for half a billion dollars, BASF bought Underwood, Becker Underwood for a billion dollars, and there's about 20 of these acquisitions. And so now five out of the top six crop uh, protection companies have made biological based acquisitions. And so I was kind of uh, the constant skeptic, skeptic. I was thinking, is this just more greenwashing? You know, it's kind of like Exxon buying a little solar company and saying, look, we're green now. Uh, we bought some biological companies. But being in the Midwest, we're inundated with these soybean and corn ads. And one of them that used to always stick out in my brain was a stupid Pancho Bativo ad, which is, you know, it's the classic you know, farm commercial, uh, there's a lot of guys standing in the middle of fields, you know, sticking his fingers through the grain and a lot of brow wiping and, you know, saying stuff like, uh, you know, you need a, a crop protection product that works as hard as you do. You know, you need tolerance, you know, there's only one name in, you know, crop protection and that's Pancho Bativo. You know, and it goes to the seed distributor, you know, Pancho Bativo, Pancho Bativo. And, uh, and I was just like, okay, whatever, you know. It's, but then I find out it's a mixed product. It's a systemic insecticide, but then it contains Bacillus firmus in, which is a nemocidal bacteria. And again, I'm, you know, they never mention a biological, they never mention them being friendly. They just, you know, and again, we have a bunch of these products that are coming out, sneaking under the radar. And I think in a few more years, they'll probably switch the uh, target and uh, start going for, um, you know, some other projects. I think I'm gonna skip some of these other ones here we don't have a lot of time. So we'll go with the conclusions. So like I was saying earlier, this is going to be the ecology decade, mostly because we have tools now that, that allow it to be the ecology decade. We, uh, looking at the microbes in res, red raspberries uh, provide some unexpected visitors. One is this ileonectria we need to understand a little bit more about to see whether this is actually emerging disease or just a, uh, uh, a semi-friendly around. We also see a bramble-specific botrytis here. 
that's in the roots. And we see that managing the phytobiome is being embraced by big ag and will continue to be embraced. Uh, and we can expect more biological pro protection products, not properties, but products in the future. So I'd like to thank my uh, collaborators, Chris Benedict and Dr. Angus Zazada here with the USDA. Thank the Red Raspberry Commission for giving me some money to do this work. And I got some few minutes for a little questions or a minute or two. Any questions, comments, hisses, boos? Any questions? No does. We've got quite a bit of time here. <laughs> Inga. Um, did any biocontrol organisms pop out in any of your analyses? Uh, not in large numbers. Uh, like I said, we, we see metarhizium, we see isaria, we see a lot of nematocidal fungi there, the hirsutellas, the pacillomyces, but not in huge numbers. But like I said, they're there, we just don't know what they're doing. Yes. So there's, there's an awful lot of organisms in those charts that you showed. Correct. How could you go about trying to identify which organisms are having an effect that you want to happen or having an effect that you don't want to happen? Yeah, it's a very complex question. Ultimately, I mean, we're going to have to tackle from many different angles. Uh, one of the things we're going to end up doing is the same kind of thing they do to catch terrorists, and that's called network analysis or co-occurring network analysis. So when, uh, basically what you do is once you get enough samples, you can start comparing like when, when the bad guy moves up, who moves up with him, who moves up down with him, uh, in the same way with the good guys, who are, who are associated with. Basically, we're looking at all the phone calls you're making to, to your friends and saying, you know, okay, you may be an early warning system that when, you know, whatever, when uh, Ilionectria gets the call, it's coming because, you know, Botrytis is ready to rock. So, so yeah, it, it will be uh, just more experiments. And like I said, network analysis is one, but there's other... Um, you know other angles, but uh, but yeah, but again, it's it's, it's any any problem that you have a mis uh, a bunch of variables is going to require a lot of data to try to isolate individual variables. Any other questions? All right, we still got a little time. Anybody? All right. All right. Well, thanks, Chris, for coming so far for us. Yes. Thanks for the great presentation. You can go ahead. <laughs>